If you recognize the words of the song that Pam just played, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Maybe I'm dating myself by knowing those words. But what wonderful words to begin our worship as we gather at Sonnenberg Mennonite Church this morning. And I extend God's love to you in this week when tomorrow we will celebrate love. And thanks for the lovely flower arrangement this morning. I'm Dottie Hathaway, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this time of worship this morning. As we think about the day of love tomorrow, know that God loves you. You are a most loved part of God's creation, and for that we are grateful. Mel's text this morning from the Gospel of Luke will focus on the message of John the Baptist as he called his listeners to prepare for the coming ministry of Jesus. Sometimes it feels like we spend most of our lives preparing for the next thing on our to-do list. We prepare for the day by getting out of bed and getting dressed and eating breakfast and brushing our teeth. Uh, kudos to Miriam on that one. We prepare for school by doing our homework and studying for an upcoming test. We prepare for our chosen career path by getting the necessary education and training. We prepare for a day of work by showing up on time and having the tools to do our job. We prepare supper by having groceries on hand and heading to the kitchen. We prepare for guests by straightening up the house and planning what we'll eat. Our quizzers have prepared for their quiz meet this afternoon by studying their material. Athletes prepare for a game by practicing and listening to what the coach says. At least the coach hopes that they listen to what they say. A number of football players have prepared rigorously for the biggest game of their lives this evening. Olympic athletes prepare for years to compete in an event that may last only a few minutes. We prepare for vacations by saving money, deciding what we'd like to see or do, making reservations and packing our bags. We prepare for big events like graduations and weddings. When Mel does premarital counseling with couples, he's always hopeful that they are as interested in preparing for a marriage that will last a lifetime as they are in preparing for a lovely wedding that will last a few hours. We prepare for retirement by working with a financial advisor and trying to save some money. We prepare for our death by writing a will and planning a funeral. How then do we hear the words of John the Baptist this morning when he tells us to prepare the way of the Lord? How do we even do that? Is that on your to-do list for today? How will you know if your preparations have been adequate? How do we prepare for the already but the not yet. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, you call us into your presence to worship you, to hear your word, and to prepare us for life in this world and the next. Prepare our hearts to hear your voice and to respond with words and actions that demonstrate our willingness to follow you in all of life. In the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Coralie, Joanna, and Pam, come and lead us in our singing. If you are able, please stand and turn to worship book number four, Unto Thy Temple, Lord, We Come.
And you can switch over to your purple sing the story. <laughs> Number one, praise the one who breaks the darkness. Gospel writer Luke sets the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist in its historical context. Luke first introduces us to John when he leaped in his mother Elizabeth's womb as she greeted Mary, the mother of Jesus, who went to visit Elizabeth when she knew that she would have a child. And this is the one whose coming John would spend his very short adult life proclaiming. Then the gospel writers are silent about John until all four of them record the event in today's scripture text. And our text is from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. Prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Prepare, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, prepare, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Prepare. Feels like I should do a little shouting while I'm up here, hey? <laughs> Thank you, Pam and Coralie and Joanna and Dottie for leading our worship this morning. Thanks to all of you who are here in person or joining us on live stream today or by recording later on, you are welcome. As Dottie mentioned, if you're ever prepared to go on an extended trip, you already know something about what it means 
to prepare the way. Whether it's the planning you do ahead of time, you know, you've got to think about where you're going, how you're going to get there, what you plan to do after you arrive, or sometimes some of those details need to be decided along the way, where you need to stop for bathroom breaks or food or fuel, everything that makes a trip go more smoothly. Kind of all fits under that heading of preparing the way. So now I'd just like for you to take a minute and try to imagine if, and I don't really know if this took place or not, but if there was a conversation that went on in heaven between God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, surely, perhaps a few angels too, in preparation for what must have been the biggest trip ever made. I'm talking about when Jesus came from that heavenly realm down to live with us here on earth. Dottie noted that the descriptive words about John the Baptist recorded in our text are quoted from the prophet Isaiah chapter 40. Bible scholars seem to agree that Isaiah's reference there was to, Roma, to royal travel in that day. It would have been about kings or nobility when they went to visit a neighboring nation or a kingdom on friendly terms or sometimes if it was going to be a dangerous trip and, and there might be some trouble along the way. They, they would often send servants ahead, people who could announce the coming dignity. You know, here, here comes so-and-so. You need to get ready for this person to show up. Or they might need to deal with the persons along the way who might cause trouble. Preparing the way, trying to make sure that everything is safe. In some cases, and I like the clip art that Chip chose for the front of the bulletin this morning, if you noticed. Sometimes it even involved making the road smoother. <laughs> getting rid of the big rocks, filling in the low places. You know, doing all those things that would make it easier for for an entourage to come along on that road. Now, when Jesus came, you might take note that he didn't move around the country with royal chariots or any of those kinds of trappings. So I'm thinking in those terms, the preparation for his coming would have been primarily one of announcement. Clear the way. Make way for a grand procession. Someone Important is coming. But the message that John the Baptist preached was more than just, he's coming. It's more like, clean the house, get rid of the cobwebs, change the sheets, the Messiah is coming, and he's going to come and live with you. <laughs> A little difference, isn't there? And next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at some of the more specific ways that John instructed people to go about that kind of preparation. But for today, I just want to focus our attention on a couple of questions. And one Dottie mentioned already, why was it even necessary to the overall plan for Jesus to come to this earth to have someone like John the Baptist preparing the way? Why was that a part of God's plan for this to happen? And then, following that, I think we can also look at the possibility of whether there's a need for someone like John in our world today. Someone to preach a gospel of repentance and preparation for the Messiah, the Christ, to come. Is that a part of our calling as individuals, as believers, and even perhaps as a church. So let's begin with that first question. Why was John the Baptist even necessary? <laughs> you ever stop to think about that? I mean, it's God's plan. It's Jesus that's doing it. Why did John the Baptist need to come ahead of time? And maybe I'm reading a bit too much into it, but if you notice, notice in, God, in Luke's gospel account, he spends almost as much time telling us about the details of John's birth as he does about the birth of Jesus. Take notice of that sometime when you're reading through there. And it's actually the way that Luke begins his whole report to his friend Theophilus about 
Jesus coming. He begins with John the Baptist, with the story of Zechariah the priest and his wife Elizabeth. We usually look at those scriptures sometime around Christmas or in Advent. Angel messengers, the guy not being able to talk for nine months. And then there's the affirmation Dottie mentioned of God's plan for Mary when she is pregnant with Jesus and she goes to visit John and, and Elizabeth. And, and Elizabeth says that her baby leaped within her at the sound of Mary's voice. And then there's a whole lengthy song of praise that Zechariah shares with the people after John is, is born. And if you look at that, at least the last part of that specifically, he talks about this vision of John being the one who is there to prepare the way of the Lord. You can find all that back in chapter 1 of Luke, ending with a verse that tells us that John grew and became strong in spirit. I think we heard that a little bit. And he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry. Now, we don't know exactly when that happened, but apparently John began his ministry at least a little while before Jesus came along and began his public ministry. All four Gospels include some mention of John's ministry and proclamation. Nearly all of them refer to that same quote from Isaiah about preparing the way and how John the Baptist would be the fulfillment of that prophecy. So I think it's pretty easy for us to assume that there was a plan for John the Baptist. It was intentional. It didn't just happen. It was a plan that went hand in hand with all of the preparations being made for Jesus to come into our world. Now that's really kind of remarkable when you stop to think about it. When you think about all of the human involvement in Almighty God bringing about the plan of salvation for our world. I mean, it's God's plan, right? <laughs> and Jesus is the principal character in carrying out that plan. But, and certainly the Holy Spirit would, would be present in many ways. But then think, you have human parents, you have the prophetic messengers from old, you have shepherds and wise men and eventually men and women who would become disciples of Jesus and you have John the Baptist in a, what seems to be a very important role in that plan as well. Could God have made all that happen without needing to rely on <laughs> we, we weak human beings? Wasn't that really even a rather risky plan for such an important heavenly mission? And so to get back to my original question, why was it that John the Baptist was even needed? What was the specific role that he would play in this journey? And to help answer that question, I want to go back to what I believe were some of the people's expectations in those days about the Messiah sent from God to deliver them. Just like we see clues in the Bible that speak to us about the second coming of Jesus, those Jewish people that lived in New Testament times also saw clues in the Old Testament, that's what they had, especially among the books of prophecy about this coming of a Messiah. And one of those texts would be in the very last chapter of what we have in our Old Testament today, Malachi chapter 4. It's almost the last verse in the Old Testament where we read these words. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Now, maybe that language doesn't sound to you like a prophecy concerning Jesus, does it? <laughs> We'd maybe more often look at it as, well, okay, that may, must be talking about the end times. But when you're hoping for that Messiah to come and, and lead a revolt against Rome... I don't think it sounds as strange at all to think of the description of that coming as a great and terrible day of the Lord. And in the generations of Jews that lived just before Jesus came, there were several men who came along and tried to lead revolts against Rome. That was something that if you were 
unhappy with the situation, you might feel like, yes, maybe if we just get everything all together and we trust God, God will give us victory over them. And there were a number who tried to do that, some more successful, some less successful down through the years, but really none of them were able to completely free the nation or get rid of the Roman influence. So I think it's really no wonder then that Bible scholars who could read the scriptures in the time before Jesus came would have been looking for some kind of a sign. How will we know when it's the true Messiah who comes? What will we see that will indicate to us that this is, this is really the Messiah? I mean, nobody really wanted to go through another unsuccessful, bloody revolution. That's something that would bring down the wrath of Rome on them even harder than before. So let's try to make sure we have the real person, right? So then that verse from Malachi becomes a bit more important to them than it might sound to us reading it today. Before the true Messiah comes, the prophet says, Elijah will come again. Either a resurrection of that Old Testament prophet himself or, or someone in Elijah's role. Now, as I hear that and as I think about it, it's not entirely clear to me how much that Old Testament prophecy might even have played a role in, in John's choice as he was growing up, as he heard something about the circumstances of his birth and what he was being called to do, how much he paid attention to that prophecy about Elijah and whether that made a difference in his choice of, of going out and living in the wilderness for quite a number of years, apparently. His rather austere lifestyle, and we didn't look at that this morning, but in other scriptures it's described as him wearing camel's hair clothing, which was sort of the, the basic stuff of that day, and a diet of locusts and wild honey. Doesn't sound exactly like the most luxurious sort of thing, does it? But it sure made people think about Elijah who apparently lived and perhaps even dressed in a similar life, lifestyle and clothing and, and most likely even ate the same diet at times. And Luke carefully frames the timing of this coming about of John's ministry, the political situation that we read about in our, our text verses. And then he says, and when this was taking place, the word of God came to John son of Zechariah. And John went out into all the region around the Jordan River, proclaiming, Messiah's coming? Well, not quite. <laughs> proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And Luke includes in there, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. Now, if you looked real carefully at those words that we have recorded from the book of Isaiah, the, the prophecy that, that was read for us, did you hear anything about repentance in there? <laughs> I didn't. Not really. It talks about preparing the way, but it doesn't mention anything about repentance. But Luke makes this very direct connection between that prophecy from Isaiah, that message of the prophet Isaiah about the preparation that's to be made for the coming Messiah, and he calls it a message of repentance. Now, that shouldn't come as a surprise to us, and it certainly would not have to the Jewish people at that time or perhaps most any time throughout their history because if you understand the Old Testament all the way from the time those people were first begun in, in the exodus from, from Egypt, throughout their, their life history in the, in the promised land, whenever they would sort of drift away from worshiping God, and then they would find themselves being threatened or, or even overpowered by their heathen neighbors, the first thing they would do, or eventually they would do, I don't know if it was the first thing, but eventually what they would be called to do is repentance. Turn back to God. Get rid of all your heathen idols. 
It's sort of like if you want God's help and favor, well, then you better come to terms with your sinfulness and with your need for God's forgiveness. So I don't think it would have been a surprise for them to hear that message from John the Baptist as well. And speaking of Baptists, I'm not quite sure of what the origin of John's practice of baptism was. Uh, perhaps it was even going back to the temple, cleansing that people would do, the priests would do especially before they went into the temple to offer sacrifices. There was ceremonial washing that needed to be done. Also understand that at the time this took place, there was a baptism of people who were coming from non-Jewish faith and wanted to become Jews. They, they went through a similar baptism process. But it was, it was sort of a symbol of the cleansing that needs to take place, the, the cleansing of repentance and forgiveness. So then the answer to my question perhaps begins to take shape. John's ministry was needed in a sense, to pro fulfill prophecy, to, to set the stage for this true Messiah to appear. But then it was also to prepare the hearts and the minds of the people who were seeking for God to come and deliver them from oppression and persecution. If you want the Messiah to come, then there's a part that you need to play. There's something that you need to do to prepare for that coming. And again, next Sunday, we'll, we'll look at some of the suggestions that John gives when, when people ask him, well, well, what does that repentance look like? What am I really supposed to do in order to prepare? We'll look at those verses next Sunday. And it was much more than just saying the words, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the wrong that I've done. No, repentance must lead to change must be positive action taken in, in terms of receiving that repentance, or it really isn't repentance to begin with. And among John's listeners, I think we can imagine there would have been some who were willing to hear this message, to make those changes in their lives, to try to really fulfill what John was telling them, and no doubt some that heard the message but were not willing to make those changes. And then that brings me to my second question. Now, we're not really looking for a Messiah to come in quite the same way as those people who were living back in Jesus' time, right? I mean, we're not living under Roman oppression. That's, they were. That's not to say that there is no oppression these days. Certainly some people in our world experience similar fear, similar persecution as the Jewish nation did back then. But even for us today, most of our fear doesn't come about uh, thinking that we might step out of line sometime when we're out and, and uh, the officials, the authorities might see us doing something that they didn't like and, and we get imprisoned or even worse. No, that's, that's not really much of a fear for most of us today. But I believe instead of that, many of us live with some sense of insecurity, a feeling that we never have quite enough. We never have enough wealth to carry us through our retirement years. We never have enough control over our lives. It just feels like everything's out of control. We never have enough to live up to the expectations we have for ourselves or the expectations that we feel from the people around us, never quite satisfied with what we have. Or the flip side of that, we're so arrogant and so proud that we feel like we do have enough. We have it all. We don't need any help from anybody. We're, we're self-sufficient. We can do everything for ourselves. Any of the problems that we encounter, well, that's, that's somebody else that's causing those problems. Either one of those kind of situations, I believe, is really similar in many ways to the oppression of the Jewish people in Jesus' time. Yes, yeah, it's, it's much more subtle than having soldiers marching through our streets and watching what we're going to do. But the truth is, we may often find ourselves in situations where we feel like the world is going to hell in a handbasket 
And we long for someone, anyone, to step in and straighten things out for us. And way too often, I'm afraid, we pin our hopes on human leaders. But eventually, and hopefully, before we get to the end of our rope, perhaps we, like those Jewish people, our heart and our mind will turn towards God as the only real source of help. The only real possibility for rescue or, or deliverance from these fears that oppress us. And as I think about that, I think, in essence, what we're really doing is asking God to make that journey from heaven to earth once again. Now, we may or we may not put it in those words, but our heart is, is crying out, God, come and save us. Is that where you are this morning? Do you know someone who may be in that position today? Again, that leads me to the second question that I asked in the beginning. Do we need? Do you and I feel a need? Does our, our world need another John the Baptist today? Someone whose simple lifestyle clashes with the, the consumerism of our world. Someone who is fearless in proclaiming a message of repentance. That word comes with a lot of baggage these days, and we might even prefer to avoid it, but I believe the principle is still relevant for us today. If we want God's help and favor, then I believe we had better come to terms with our sinfulness our need for God's forgiveness. And there's no other way that leads so directly to God's heart of love and mercy than to repent of our wrongdoing, to humble ourselves and to ask for God's forgiveness. And the blessing is we're not required to do all that by ourselves. That house cleaning that I mentioned earlier when we're expecting somebody important to come, no, we've been offered help with that through the power of the Holy Spirit. That Spirit is available to us. That Spirit is ready and willing and able to help prepare us for God's wonderful plan of salvation and transformation. Yeah, I believe we do need a John the Baptist in our world today. Someone to simply call our attention away from all the confusion and the noise around us. Someone to, to help us see that the changes that we're looking for in our world need to start with a change in me. Someone who's not seeking to be the star in the limelight, but someone who is pointing us to the sun. And I truly believe that God in God's infinite wisdom is still calling out people, men, women, young, old, to prepare the way. And you may know someone who has been that person for you. Or here's the real kicker. God may be asking you to be that person. Or someone else. God may be asking us as a church to be that messenger, to be that person who prepares the world for Jesus to come again into our presence, into our midst, to be there for us. Go out there in the wilderness. God may be saying to us, whatever that wilderness might look like today, Go out there in that wilderness. Go out there and, and speak up. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And I hope you noticed the very last part of that prophecy as well, our text for this morning. Verse 6. And then all flesh, that is 
all people shall see the salvation of God. Amen. May it be so. If you will turn to 183 in your blue hymnal on Jordan's Banks, the Baptist cry, and this is a pretty robust one, so I recommend standing. Mm -hmm. 